Hi everyone, um, I'm Emma O'Toole, um, I'm the Collections and Interpretation Manager for the Irish Heritage Trust and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to this talk that we're going to have about the conservation of this painting here. Now, this painting has been conserved for the last five weeks and normally when conservation happens with paintings it often happens behind the scenes and you don't get to see exactly what's happening but thankfully we have Pearl here today who did the conservation and she's going to tell us all the different details about exactly that process. And then we're going to have Matt speaking um, as well and he's going to talk to us about the family in this painting because this painting is exceptional in that it actually has remained in this house since it was painted in 1833. Now it is also a great pleasure to welcome you here today because this is actually the first members talk for the Irish Heritage Trust. So many of you will be aware that the Irish Heritage Trust took over just about four weeks ago in Johnstown Castle and it's a big part of um, our remit is to protect properties and protect the collections that are in them. And so about a year ago, the Irish Heritage Trust started to look at Johnstown Castle and the refurbishment of the castle. And one major part of the castle and its collections is, of course, artworks. Now, over the course of the last few months, even, we have actually taken in quite a lot of loans and donations. So there's new artworks hanging within the castle. But also, um, we looked at the ones that were previously in the castle beforehand. And this one, of course, was a big part of it. And as I said, it's been here since 1833. And it's about a family that was really significant to the castle in the development of the castle itself and the architecture, but also the development of the estate as well. Now, this talk coincides with National Heritage Week which obviously runs, it started just at the weekend and runs for the full week. So I'm sure some of you will be aware of it, but the theme is uh, past times in past times. So a bit of a mouthful, but of course, of course, art was a huge part of past times and particularly in the 19th century when this painting was made. And it was a part of a women's pastimes, just as a part of their etiquette. They learned to draw, they learned to paint. Men, of course, went off on the Grand Tour and were fueled by all the culture that they saw and brought it back to Ireland. But then also we had the establishment of places like the National Gallery of Ireland, the Royal Liberian Academy. And this allowed people to see paintings and portraits and give them the idea, I'd like a portrait too. And so quite a lot of aristocracy and the elite decided to have their portrait painted in the 19th century. And the family here, the Groga Morgans, were no exception. Now, as I had mentioned that this uh, painting has remained in the castle ever since it was first painted by E.T. Paris, a renowned painter. And I know Pearl is going to talk a little bit about Paris. But it's important to mention that actually, and I'll grab it here, uh, this painting was actually um, originally made to, hung, uh, to hang in this room here. So originally this room here had a cantilevered staircase and at the very top of it was the painting itself. So it's really fitting that we actually have this talk in this room here. Um, today, it obviously, the staircase is gone, has been gone since the um, uh, 1950s when it was considered that it had dry rot and um, but it's been moved to the, the dining room now. So that's where you'll actually see the painting hanging. But just to mention, I'll pass this around if you want to have a look. Uh, just to mention as well is that what's really interesting about looking at artworks in historic houses is that they're a little bit unique and exceptional to looking at them in museums and galleries. And that's because in museums and galleries, they are environmentally controlled places, okay? And you're told, don't touch, don't stand too close, all of this. But in historic houses, the idea of the paintings was always that they would hang as a part of the house and they would be a part of the home and a part of the movements of that home. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing in the sense that what it means in historic houses is that they're often paintings are exposed to a lot more factors and um, things like light coming in can deteriorate the painting heating and temperature and humidity and um, moisture in the air, everything like that can upset the painting over the years. And like that, this painting is the guts of 170 years old. So it's had those factors for that amount of time. And over that time then what happens is, is that the layers of varnish that were originally put on start to discolor and start to yellow. And then also parts of the paint will start to flake off. 
And that's exactly what actually happened to this painting here, is that it got discolored over time. Parts of the paint started to, to flake off. And so we decided as part of the, the trust, decided that this would be the painting that we're going to conserve with the idea that we will uh, start to conserve other artworks in the collection as well. And that's the whole remit of the Irish Heritage Trust, is to not only preserve the collections for our current generation, but we're looking to the future. And with the work that Pearl has actually done, the idea is, is that hopefully this painting will last a good, the guts of 100 years anyway from Pearl's work. But Pearl's going to talk about all the work um, that she did in just a minute. But I'm going to hand you over now to Matt, who's obviously the curator here at uh, Johnstown Castle. Yeah, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to be able to speak to you uh, uh, this morning. Um, if we regard this painting as like a photograph, um, a moment in time that's been captured, I'm going to set the scene for this painting, but I'm going to turn the dial back uh, to the uh, 17th century to give you the, the background and the run-up to this actual painting. And I'm going to do that with the help of my trusty uh, colleague here, Henri, who's going to be doing a bit of work for me. Um, but um, just to say, uh, to begin with, the, the original family that were here were the Esmond family, okay? I'm not going to bore you with their history, because that's a long history stretching over 500 years from when they first arrived in the 12th century. Um, and they were here at Johnstown Castle, but also at Rathlan and Castle on the other side of the lake. Um, but everything changed then in the 17th century. We had the English Civil War taking place. And um, we had Oliver Cromwell coming to Ireland by hook or by crook, he said he would take Ireland, didn't he? He would take it by the Hook Peninsula in Wexford or the village of Crook on the Waterford side of the estuary, by hook or by crook. And he came here to uh, Wexford in 1649 and absolutely destroyed the place, uh, killed over 3,000 uh, uh, people in Wexford and came here to Johnstown Castle. And really the writing was on the wall for the Esmond family. They were part of the Catholic gentry. Uh, well-established family. Um, but for them, the choice was to hell or to Connacht, be killed or be banished out to the West where the soil was very infertile and very hard to make a living. So the Esmonds had to pack their bags and leave Rathlanan and leave Johnstown Castle uh, behind. So what did Cromwell do with this, with this place in Rathlanan? Well, he gave it away to one of his soldiers, a Lieutenant Colonel Overstreet. Instead of paying him, he just gave him lots of land and two fine castles. So this is where our family tree uh, starts coming into it, and this is where Henri is going to help me by holding this up, otherwise we're going to get very sore arms. Okay, so we have Lieutenant Colonel Overstreet, the Cromwellian soldier. Okay, didn't really suit his purposes to retain Johnstown Castle or Rathlanan. So it, um, it ended up in the, ha in the hands of his niece, a lady by the name of Elizabeth Reynolds, and they were merchants uh, here in Wexford. So uh, Elizabeth Reynolds uh, was married to John Reynolds. And this is where we get our first heraldic feature, which is actually depicted uh, on the painting. So up on the top right there, you can see a lion up on its legs, a, li a lion uh, rampant, and that is the emblem of the Reynolds family. So we have our first family. So John and Elizabeth, uh, they had three daughters, and it was Mary Reynolds um, who uh, inherited Johnstown Castle, and she married a man by the name of John Grogan. So the castle then passed into the hands of the Grogan family, and they were here thereafter and their descendants. So then we have our next heraldic feature, which is the lion passant. So the lion walking along there, you can see up on the top. So this became the Grogan family home and they enlarged it um, to cater for their burgeoning family. So John and Mary produced one, two, three, four, five children. She then died, he married again, and they produced one, two, three, four, five, six children. So a big family and needed to enlarge the place to cater for the, for the big family. I'm going to point out just two people, seemingly insignificant on this family tree, but actually very significant, over on the right here. So we have uh, Mary Grogan, daughter of Mary and John, and we have a Sarah Grogan, just here as well. And Mary Gro Grogan uh, married a man by the name of Andrew Knox, and they lived at Rathmacnee, just down the road from us, Rathmacnee Castle. 
Previously, it was the Roster family, where it then became the Knox uh, family home. Sarah Grogan is not mentioned here, um, but she actually married a man by the name of Morgan, William Morgan, and they had a son called Samuel Morgan, and we'll come back to that in a bit. But the line then descended through uh, a Cornelius Grogan, who married an Elizabeth White, and they had one, two, three, four, five children, one of whom was called Overstreet, so they're very proud of their Cromwellian ancestry. And John Grogan, guess what? He married his first cousin, Catherine Knox. Okay, so Catherine over here. So this is where we get our next heraldic feature. So bottom sort of left there is actually a falcon, and that's the emblem of the Knox family. You're doing well, Henri, keep it up. <laughs> um, so John and Catherine Knox, um, as you can see, they produced a lot of children as well, and a lot of overstreets. So they're still very proud of their Cromwellian ancestry. Um, and one of, one of these is actually called Andrew Knox Grogan as well. So again, they're constantly picking up the different names from the different marriages. Um, and one of, their, one of their children was the next to inherit um, Johnstone Castle, and that was Cornelius Grogan. Uh, for, the, for some of you who may have heard of Cornelius Grogan because he found himself on the rebel side in the 1798 rebellion and lost his life and was hung from Wexford Bridge that he'd only just finished paying for. There's gratitude for you. Um, so that was the end of Cornelius. So um, because a lot of these other children had died previous to him, it then went through John Knox Grogan. Okay. Um, he married a lady by the name of Anne Coote. If you look outside the castle, you'll see one of the heraldic shields has three birds on it. The birds are actually coots, like, like uh, waterfowl. And the coots returned to Johnstown Castle last year in terms of the birds. We have them for the first time on the lower lake. So there we have John Notzgrogan and we have Anne Coote. So um, they had a number of, a number of children. Um, and then John uh, married Elizabeth Fitzgerald. So Anne Coote died, and he then married Elizabeth Fitzgerald. So then we have our next little emblem on our shield. That's the Fitzgerald saltire, the Red Cross. So Hamilton is referencing his, uh, his mother there. Um, John Knox Grogan, um, he passed away in 1814. Hamilton, who we see in this picture here, was uh, born in 1807, okay? Um, so he actually inherited John Stan Castle at quite a young age. He was only seven years old uh, when he technically inherited John Stan Castle. He couldn't do anything with it because you had to be 21 to really inherit his land and estates. Okay, so he had to wait a while before he could really properly get his hands on Johnstown Castle. Now, we're going to just pick up this line here. Remember about Sarah Grogan, she married the man by the name of Morgan, and their son was Alderman Samuel Morgan. So technically, he was Hamilton's first cousin, twice removed. And Alderman Morgan uh, passed away in 1827. He was a very wealthy man in Waterford, had land all over the place. What did he do with the land? He gave it to Hamilton. So, I'm just going to read out an account from the time. This was, this was quite a surprise in society at the time, that Alderman Morgan, this wealthy man, should give it to a distant relative. And I'm just going to read out an account from the Waterford Mail of September 1827. This is how the good people of Waterford reacted to this. So it says, the late Alderman Morgan. The vast, I can pop that down now if you want. <laughs> the vast wealth left by this old gentleman, we understand, by no means falls short of the amount he had long supposed to possess, and cannot be less than a quarter of a million, at the very least. Waterford, however, we regret to say, shares but a very inc inconsiderable portion of it. Uh, to the Protestant orphan institu institution, he has left £100. To the House of Industry, a like sum. And these are the only public establishments to which he has made any bequests. 
The miscellaneous legacies, in fact, do not exceed £2,000. And with this trifling diminu diminution, the Messrs Grogan, or as, or as already mentioned, will possess the whole of his uh, wealth and personal property. These gentlemen are minors and sons of the late John Knox Grogan of Johnstown Castle in County, Walks, uh, County Wexford, uh, already the inheritors, independently of a very ample um, fortune. The elder is to take uh, the name of Morgan. The family of these young gentlemen and that of the deceased were distantly connected. Um, he had much nearer surviving relatives who have partaken but very sparingly, or not at all, of his bounty. Upon the whole, we may safely pronounce that as he occupied but a small share of general sympathy while living, so his memory stands but very little chance of being embalmed in the kindliest odours of general recollection now that he is dead. It should be observed in justice to the departed, however, that he was by no means a miser, in that sense in which the word is commonly understood. His wealth was the gradual and natural accumulation of an income which he had no taste for spending, rather than the hoarding of penurious avarice. And there are very few anecdotes related of him which exhibit any very extraordinary traits of the miser's habit. His father before him had been a member of the Civic Corporation and an alderman, and had left his successor an ample independence. The tolls of the ancient ferry of Waterford, uh, before the bridge was built, belonged to his family and were purchased from the late alderman by the bridge company. So they weren't much impressed. But to say that he was forgotten about is obviously not true because we're still talking about him today. So, um, Hamilton uh, inherited the, the Morgan uh, estates and ended up with 20,000 acres all over Ireland. So uh, that was in 1827. He still couldn't do anything about it because he was still not old enough. However, uh, the following year in 1828, he was 21. And he can suddenly inherit all the money and all the property. Um, there's a small account in the Waterford Mail of um, July 1828, and it says, the coming of age of Hamilton Knox Grogan Morgan was established at Johnstown Castle on Monday evening by unquestionably the most splendid fate ever given in this neighbourhood. It doesn't give any more detail than that, but you can bet your bottom dollar it was quite a party. And the only condition for Hamilton was to add the name Morgan um, to his name. So the symbol of the Morgan family is the griffin or the dragon. So therefore we have Hamilton, Knox, Grogan, Morgan, who became possibly the richest untitled landowner in Ireland. Sorry. Now, um, in 1829, he married this lady here. So she is Sophia Rowe. Um, for those of you that know the area, the Rowes lived in the area now occupied by Ballycross Apple Farm. So they're down near Bridgetown. And the, um, the heraldic shield for the Rowe family is the red one there with the wheat sheaves on it. So Sophia Rowe. We don't know precisely uh, when she was born. We don't, we've never actually found um, a birth date for Sophia. We know when she, when she was died. So they married in 1829. And in 1830, they had their first daughter, Elizabeth Geraldine. And in 1833, um, this painting uh, was commissioned by a man called Paris. And I'm now going to hand over to Pearl there to talk a bit more about this painting. Hi everyone, uh, so I recognise some faces but as Emma said I'm a painting conservator um, and I have been here for the last five weeks working on this painting in this room actually, sometimes on a scaffold, sometimes on the floor. <laughs> um, but uh, I, So I'm going to begin by just talking a little bit about the artist and then I'll go on to describe the process of the conservation treatment. So here um, on this slide, you can see the signature, which is located in the lower right corner, uh, E.T. Paris. Um, so Ed 
Edmund Thomas Paris. He was born in 1793 in London. And he, um, he actually achieved, he was quite famous in the 19th century. He achieved quite um, a, a high reputation, um, although he's quite like relatively obscurely known today. He, he's, he's not that famous nowadays. Um, but he trained in the Royal Academy schools in London. And he had very high ambitions. You can see here, he's given himself the title historical painter to Her Majesty Queen Adelaide, the consort to Queen Adelaide. Um, so he had these ambitions um, to paint historical paintings, which through the Royal Academy would have been um, taught to be the highest level of painting. Um, he actually painted a really large scale, which it was claimed to be the largest painting ever made in uh, the 19th century in this building, which was uh, a visitor attraction in Regent's Park. Um, neither the building nor the painting survived today. It was actually dismantled in the 19th century also. Um, so I think having done a project on, on that scale, it was a panoramic view of London. Um, he, he, that really put his name out there. Um, so he had these ambitions for historical painting. Um, however, a lot of what he did um, throughout his life were, um, a lot of the works he did were actually portraiture. Um, so this is a painting that he did. This is an etching of a painting. It, it's in the British Museum collection. And um, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but it's obviously a woman with a, a very similar back, backdrop to our painting here. Um, and this, painted in 1830, was purchased by the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Robert Peel. So I think this um, possibly commission, but definite purchase and ownership by such a prominent um, member of society really uh, put him out there as a portrait painter. Uh, to, uh, of, in demand at the time. Um, so he would have traveled here. We know he traveled here um, because he made a drawing of the castle while he was here. Um, and this um, piece of paper here hanging off the table, we kind of have assumed that it's an indication or uh, a symbol of their plans, but it could also be the artists uh, pop, pop, popping in, you know, a reference to his own work here, um, a drawing that he made, it could be. Um, but the, the drawing is in the Chagas building. So we know that he was here on site. Um, however, the painting was most likely painted in London. The canvas is from London and um, you can imagine the spec being sent over and this thing arriving here um, and Hamilton and Sophia receiving it. Um, so, let's see, where are we? Um, so, actually, just to point out before I move on that there are a lot of similarities. Although we, we've been questioning over the last five weeks, uh, is this in the castle? And it, it is. You can see the architectural references in the background there. You, ha you have the tr trefoil and um, similar, similar style and uh, architectural features that you find in the castle. However, the backdrop, um, the curtain, this is all very similar in this painting. Um, and also, you can see that he's done, um, he, he put in a lot of detail into the drapery, the clothes worn by the, the sitter, and the lace. And that's the very same here. So you can imagine he had a kind of a studio setup. Um, he would have done possibly drawings of the sitters. But then this was made in London and sent here, I'm almost certain. Um, so this is another example of the type of portraiture he did. Um, he called them emblem paintings, um, showing female subjects as allegorical figures. Um, and he, he did achieve uh, you know, some of his lofty ambitions in that he, in 1838, was commissioned to paint the coronation of Queen Victoria. Um, so the, the, aim, the first aim here with the treatment of this painting really was to clean the painting. Um, so on this slide here, you can see on the left before and on the right after removal of varnish, as Emma described earlier, um, varnish applied to paintings, um, it, it acts as a protect, protective layer, but it also saturates the colors, um, these wonderful colors that he was using. And um, natural resins discolor over time, like any organic material. Also, people were smoking um, and, Th these resin, these varnishes essentially dull the quality of the original painting. So I have 
in the treatment, my first stage was to remove this layer of varnish. Um, and in the cleaning also, you can see here some of the dots of previous restoration that was carried out. So I believe the painting was previously restored um, around the 1960s or 70s. Um, so this varnish was probably partially the original varnish, but most definitely restoration varnish. So it just goes to show how quickly those materials discolor. Um, so there's some more s images here just of the before and after. And it's really worth having a, a close look at the painting. But the, the slides show detail, but do go up and have a look more closely on the left before and the right after uh, cleaning. Um, here is a detail of um, the waistcoat worn by Hamilton. And I'm not sure if you can see here on the slide, there's areas of like a dark green material and also a really crackly broken up varnish layer. Um, and it, it, initially when I looked at it, I thought, okay, it's a dark navy color. It's kind of, it goes with the jacket. But as I carried out cleaning tests, I realized that underneath and um, this dark greeny brown um, was actually a really bright blue, um, which I believe is French ultramarine, which was, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But so they're the kind of um, benefits in cleaning. So you can really see the quality of the original um, painting. Then again, I think as Matt mentioned and, and Emma as well, the background of the painting, um, which probably hadn't been cleaned before, had a, a, quite a few layers of varnish and the details of the heraldic sim symbols and the inscriptions were virtually invisible. Um, and also the sense of recession in space. So this lovely curtain that he, the, the rich fabric, um, you can see here in the next slide that it is actually was originally intended to have a sense of depth um, in creating the architectural space and setting for the painting. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, as well as varnish and overpaint um, removal, the treatment of the paint layer in terms of it stabilizing it, um, that was the second phase of the treatment. Um, so here on Sophia's face before treatment, you can see some losses here where it's not just paint, but also the ground layer. So this canvas would have been prepared in, in a, a canvas a colorman's shop in London, prepared with a, a gesso, and the painting was made on that. Um, uh, in this case, both the gesso and the paint had been flaking away um, at the junctures uh, where, where the cracks were meeting. Um, so there were lots of areas that were quite vulnerable um, to further loss, and obviously some losses had already occurred. Also, so, uh, some, there were two major tears, this one here, and um, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you another tear in a moment, but this, this shows paint loss in Hamilton's face and also some of the old restorations. Uh, you can see them clearly? Okay. Um, so this is a tear here as well, which was just below the lace um, on the left side of her collar. And um, so just to give a brief description, cons consolidation is the term we use in conservation for uh, inserting adhesive into a paint layer. Um, in this case, I was using a gelatin, an animal skin glue, really low concentration. Um, and then for the tear mending, a totally different adhesive is used. Um, it's a, a thermoplastic, small amounts of powder, heated um, and extremely strong bond with a tiny amount of material. So, so they're the types of treatment um, which were carried out on both the canvas and the paint layer. Um, so, so this slide here then shows this, the next phase, which having cleaned the painting and secured uh, areas of, of vulnerable paint, um, all of the loss then was filled in. So this is a, a gesso material, very similar to the priming that would have been put on um, by, by the canvas maker. And um, it brings the level up, uh, the level is flush then and ready for, for restoration. Um, so then the retouching of the, the losses and the damages could begin. Um, so just to, to explain, you know, some areas of, of age 
um, will create cracks and they can, you know, they would be dealt with in restoration, um, but they're slightly different to areas of damage. So, so this, these are what would be referred to as drying cracks um, to do with the way the paint was applied, the kind of consistency. Um, so the cracks were, were retouched. Um, some more detail of the, the retouching process. So this is uh, Elizabeth's face having been cleaned um, and also filled and then after restoration um, again left before before filling or um, retouching and then on the right after um, Sophia's face and the dog as well the hound <laughs> um, so just to, to explain the materials that so this is an oil painting um, oil medium. What I use, or what's common practice now in painting conservation, um, is to use an aldehyde resin. And that is soluble. Not, not only does it not discolor um, and very slow to cross link over time, it is re it's removable in the future without affecting the original paint. Um, and also in certain lighting in UV lighting, if, the, if, this photograph, if this painting was photographed in UV lighting, it would be very obvious where original, non-original paint um, is located. And then a final varnish layer was applied. Um, so the varnish applied was um, one that, uh, so again, a synthetic varnish hydrocarbon resin. Don't want to bore you with the details, but um, rather than it being a natural material, it's an acrylic material and also with an added light scavenger, which will basically sl really slow down the process of discoloration. And like Emma said, we, we currently, based on current scientific knowledge, we know it's like 100 years, basically. It's good for 100 years. Um, so just some more before and after. Okay, so just to, to point out, um, as I mentioned earlier, just in the cleaning process, um, the, some, some really interesting pieces of information came to light, um, including this pigment, for example, the French ultramarine, which just was not visible before. Uh, French ultramarine was only synthesized in 1828, so he, Paris, was, he knew what he was doing. He was really um, ambitious and clued into what was available at the time, so he was sourcing the best materials. Um, and also the green, it's such a striking color, the green um, dress worn by Sophia, um, I believe is painted using a material that was developed in uh, 1814, it was called Paris Green. Um, and it was, it's quite famously known to have been poisonous actually. It was arsenic and copper based. Um, but the ladies of the time were absolutely mad for this green color. Um, and they had to be seen in this. So this is, this is a dress actually dyed with that color. Um, so I think it's quite interesting that the artist then used that to paint the dress. Um, and so there's some of, some of the details that came up. And then also to point out, um, in terms of restoration, um, lots, of, lots of decisions are being made all the time, what to remove, what to keep, what to reconstruct, do I have enough information? This here, um, piece worn by Sophia, um, it was previously it was previously damaged. So there was a, a big paint loss here, which was retouched in. Um, however, the previous restorer never filled in this gap of chain. Um, and I didn't have a reference for it. I tried to find a reference, I didn't have it. So the decision I made was to leave that as, an, as a, a part of its history. Um, that you know, it had been damaged, it had been restored before. Um, and that will then go into the documentation. A big part of what we do is document the whole process. Um, so in future, anybody who wants to know what's happened to this painting can, can easily find out. Um, so sorry, this was the slide to illustrate what I've just said. Um, this, this was, as I discovered, over paint on the left. And this was when I, I basically reconstructed what I, what I could based on the, the jewel, um, but left the rest. Um, and then a couple of more of the details that 
became more obvious um, after the treatment. The, the castle, um, again, as I said, is it, it's probably both a reference to their plans for the castle, but also possibly um, a reference to the drawing he made and his part of the whole story. Um, and then I think the, the inscription, you know, it's so important that, as Matt said, what, what they were doing at the time, they were commissioning this really um, popular, probably quite expensive painter to come and do this portrait um, and, you know, to stamp their identity on, it, on this in terms of their, um, their family crest coat of arms and also then their, all their titles here. Um, so that's the end of my slideshow, but if anyone has any questions, please, please do ask. Yeah. Um, we obviously have two dogs in, in the painting. We have a little lap dog there, which is probably like a poodle or Bichon Frise, something like that. We have a pointer dog here. Hamilton was very uh, interested in hunting. Um, on the other side of the road to, to where we are now, that was traditionally the deer park in the, in the area known as Kildavan. 100 villagers were cleared out of that and they created the deer park. Um, and in, around the time this painting um, was commissioned, they had about 250 deer uh, there that they used for hunting purposes, obviously uh, for shooting uh, pheasants as well, that type of thing, with their own game, gamekeeper living on the estate. Um, we've not been able to match precisely the, uh, the uh, settee in the, in the painting, but it's very similar to other examples that we have um, in the castle here. Um, as we mentioned before, this is the only painting that survives in the castle. All the other paintings were sold off um, at the auction that took place here in 1944, other than some art examples of paintings which were retained by, by the family. Um, so if we go back to thinking about this as, um, as like a photograph, well, what, what happened to these people after 1833? Well, obviously, they're pr proudly showing off um, one of the architect's plans, uh, which would be in its infancy at that time. Um, Daniel Robertson was the architect who also designed the gardens at Tapower's Court. And it's really pretty much a 20-year project. They didn't really finish until the 1850s um, to leave us with the estate and the castle and the, and the lakes and the gardens, such as what we, we enjoy today. So it was really long-term thinking. Uh, they also put their money into um, the estate church. Uh, they created um, cottages for workers and they also put money into an estate school as well so they spread the wealth around and about the locality. Um, in 1837, so just um, a few years later, they produced another daughter and her name was Sophia uh, Knox, so picking up the, the mother's name there. Um, and in 1839 they produced a third daughter and her name was Jane. And this is a photograph of Jane. Um, obviously very fond of their dogs, as you can see. So they, they, at that stage, obviously, they had three daughters. Um, but in 1845, they lost the middle daughter, um, Sophia. Uh, we don't know how she died, but she was about eight years old at the time. Um, in 1847, he finally became a member of Parliament. He tried un unsuccessfully in 1841 as a Conservative candidate, but wasn't successful. But he was successful as an independent candidate and served until 1852. So he was constantly going between um, Wexford and London. Um, sadly, he passed away in 1854, so he was only 46 when he died. He actually died in London. His body was conveyed back here, and he's buried in the local estate church of Rathaspic. So he didn't really reach a great age. Um, his widow, Sophia, um, she remarried a couple of years later um, in 1856, and guess what? She remarried back into that ancient old family that were here and banished by Cromwell, the Esmonds. So she married Sir Thomas Esmond. Uh, he lived at Balinestra uh, near Gorey, and he came to live with Sophia here at Johnstone Castle. Uh, Jane, meanwhile, she, uh, well, in fact, both daughters did quite well for themselves. Obviously, you can see from this painting, they have aristocratic uh, pretensions, but they don't, they, they're still kind of um, pretty much new money rather than aristocracy. Um, but Elizabeth, uh, she married uh, Robert, Dean, Robert Dean of um, Springfield Castle in County Limerick, and she went off to, to live with him. Um, this is a photograph of Jane, as she became as a young adult. 
and she married George Hastings Forbes, who was the Earl of Granard um, at Newtown Forbes Castle in County Longford. And they divided their time between uh, Longford and County Wexford. So she did well for herself as well. And this is a photograph, by the way, of Sophia in later life with Sir Thomas Esmond. Changed somewhat since then. Um, a man called Lacey visited the castle in the 1850s and wrote a diary of the time and actually references this painting. He said that at the time, Sophia looks pretty much as she does in the painting um, of the time of Paris. Um, Hamilton, however, has obviously put on a bit of weight uh, if you read the description, um, but his facially looks fairly similar. Um, Sophia passed away in 1867. We think she was in her 60s, but we don't have a precise birth date, so we're not entirely sure. Um, sadly, Jane passed away just a few years later in 1872. Uh, she was only 33. Uh, she died here at Johnstown Castle. She was nursed by a recently established order of nuns, the Sisters of the Order of St. John of God. And her body was then taken to Newtown Falls, where she's buried in the village church there. Uh, which she and George had largely paid for because Jane had converted to become Catholic. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, meanwhile, um, she lost her husband um, quite early on. So uh, Robert Dean, who took the name Morgan, Robert Dean Morgan, uh, passed away in 1867. Uh, but she lived um, in, for many years in a place called Arkandrisk, which is uh, near the National Heritage Park and uh, she reached a ripe old age of 90 and passed away in uh, 1920. Oh, we'll just come back to our family tree here. Henri, good man. So we've gone to Hamilton and then we've come through the line with Jane who inherited Johnstown Castle and married Forbes. Um, although Jane uh, died at quite a young age, they did produce two daughters, uh, Lady uh, Sophia Forbes and Lady Adelaide Forbes. And it was Lady Adelaide Forbes who married Lord Morris Fitzgerald and became known as Lady Morris, okay? And she was the last private residence here at Johnstown Castle. Um, she passed away in 1942. Uh, the line then went through um, her daughter, uh, Kathleen, um, who married uh, Michael Lawrence Lakin because the son and heir, Gerald Fitzgerald, um, had been killed in action in the First World War. Kathleen and Michael uh, produced two sons, uh, Gerald Michael Lakin, who was killed in the Second World War in Tunisia, he was in the tank regiment, and Morris Victor Lakin. Um, he was badly wounded in the same campaign. campaign. Uh, and it was Morris uh, Victor Lakin who handed the place over as part of the Johnstown Agricultural College in 1955. Um, so passed over to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, Morris Victor had two sons, uh, Richard Lakin and Michael Lakin. And Henri is the son of Michael Lakin. And that's the end of the tale. <laughs> Thank you, Henri. So I should say Henri would be the great, great, great grandson of Hamilton there. <laughs> Thank you.